two discs that are herniated, and these are small herniations at C3-4 and C5-6. Our patient comes to us from Nicaragua, and he's a, a surfer living in Nicaragua who um, has suffered with neck pain for some time. And we've just placed the first needle at C3-4. We're getting ready to do the second needle. And I just wanted to, I know we're having some issues with our Wi-Fi, so bear with us, shot. I'm gonna place this needle and we're gonna do our discogram at C3-4 to look for the tear and to stain the herniated nucleus that is degenerated blue, shot. Perfect, let's show the audience right there, let's shot. Show them the tear. You can see the tear. Look at the herniation. That's the herniation. Show them the tear. See the tear? No, down low. Right there. You guys see the arrow? We see it. Yeah, that is the tear in the back of the disc through the annulus. And show them the herniation. It looks like a lump. Th those herniations are bigger than you see on the MRI. Now, why are there two humps? Because if the, the fluoro is not lined up perfectly lateral, what you're gonna see is a double hump for the herniations at both sides. And that's what we're seeing, a left and a right herniation at the back of the C3-4 disc. So that's actually a lot worse than what the MRI showed, um, shot. All right, I gotta put the needle in a little bit further so it doesn't pop out. And we're gonna keep an eye on it, okay? We're gonna come back to that disc later. Let me uh, place the 5-6, because we're skipping 4-5. There's no herniation at C4-5. We're going straight to 5-6. Most commonly, our patients have a herniation next to each other, usually 4-5-5-6 five, five, or 5 six, six, seven, or 4 five, five, six, six, seven. but this patient has a skipped disc that's normal. MRI. Looks perfect. Huh? Yeah, what? Oh, uh, a little bit is fine. Shot? All right. Let's get an AP. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. The good news is he's got a nice nice neck. It's thin and the s you can feel the spine. There we are, we're in the middle. Look at the tear up there. Show them the tear on that while I place this. See the tear at three, four on the patient's right? And you can see we go opposite of the worst herniation. Show them the tear. There it is. Yep, from the tip of the needle out. Pretty cool. And there's dye right there. Show them the dye in the foramen, right around the nerve root. Yep, right there. All right, let's go back and get a lateral. This is a really nice surgery shot so far. Shot. I'm going through the disc now in the midline. Shot. This is the 5 6. Shot. All right, what you're watching, folks, for those of you who don't know, this is the most state of the art spine surgery in the world. It's endoscopic, so it's very minimally invasive. There's no fusion done, there's no metal put in. Why would you ever want those things? You don't. This is more advanced, less invasive, and better results and outcomes. Sean, Luis, I need a little shoulder pull. Just a little shoulder. All right, we're gonna do our injection. Sean? All right, we need a little more. Somebody's hand may be there. Sean? All right, we are not getting a very much uh, extravasation here. Sean? All right, maybe we're just not seeing it very well. All right, so we're gonna start with number five, six. You can actually count, go ahead and relax. Let's show the audience how we count. And by the way, you can see the double facets there, uh, Jordan. So we should not have that. That's a orbital issue. You need to change the orbit. Probably the head is rotated a little bit. But go ahead and count from the top. That's worse. It's the other way. Shot. That's better. That's nice. All right. So show them the C2. Three. Four. Five. Six. So those are the number five and six vertebral bodies. And the disc we're fixing is number five, six and three, four. Everybody agree? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a little numbing medicine in the skin before we make our incision. And the incisions will be four millimeters. We're injecting local.
So far, our patient is doing great. Just for those of you who don't know, the face is here, the chest is here, this is the neck, and we're going in on the left side of the neck with two small incisions. Each one is four millimeters. I'm only gonna make one right now. And Luis, help me keep an eye, please, on um, three, four, while we do this. So you can see how tiny the incision is. It's four millimeters. And we're gonna do two of those. Shot. Shot. I wanna keep my guide wire in place while I take the spinal needle out. Shot. And I just felt it catch and pull. Shot. Good, perfect. So now we're gonna bring the dilator down. You see the dilator, the tip is tapered. Um, the guide wire is bent just a little bit. It's probably okay, but we just have to be careful with it. Shot. If you're gonna do this kind of surgery using guide wires, it's very important to stabilize the guide wire. Again, we're gonna go down through the incision. Shot. Now we're passing, if you look at the tip on that x-ray, we're passing the endotracheal tube right now. Show them the endotracheal tube on the x-ray. Yep, show them the esophageal temperature probe. Perfect, so you know where the trachea is, you know where the esophagus is. Shot. And it looks like we're going through those structures, but we're not, we're going to the side of them. Shot. Now, for those of you wondering how long have we been doing this type of surgery for, the answer is 16 years at Duke Spine Institute. Have we published this procedure? Yes, absolutely. And yeah, we're in the middle. Go ahead and line up the spinous processes a little bit better. And you can see the tip shot, please. Let's go. Yep, that's perfect. Look at the tip of the dilator. It's right superimposed over the spinous process there of, of C5. So 16 years this procedure has been done and in 16 years we've not had a single surgery, surgical complication. It's very safe. Um, so I'm trying to push the dilator through the ALL and the anterior annulus. I'm not able to do it so I'm just gonna gently tap it through. And it's not cutting anything, we're literally just gently spreading the fibers, okay? I can feel it advancing with my left hand, so I'm controlling the movement, shot. I'm at the back of the disc, I can feel the tear right now. I'm inside the tear in the back of the disc. Pretty big tear actually, bigger than I thought based on, um, based on the uh, discogram. <laughs> Any questions from our audience? No current questions, but we do have a comment from Liz Lindsay on oh. Facebook. Hi, Liz. And she said, Duke Spine Institute, blessings one life at a time. Thank you all. God bless you, Liz, and you and your family. Thank you. Liz is a nurse. She's been a nurse for many, many years and a patient of ours. And she's always willing to share her story. All right, so we're going to be going through the five, six disc. And... Um, you know, let's give our audience an AP view so they can see what we're doing here. And you'll see how on the lateral view, it looks like there's, um, we're taking up a lot of the disc, but on the AP, you realize how small the tube is relative to the volume of the disc itself. There it is. So show them the disc side to side, left side, right side. That's not yet. No, start over on the left, stop right there a little bit further to the left. There, that is the uncovertebral joint. From there to there is the disc. Show them the foramen on the left, yep. And show them the foramen on the right, yep. That's where the nerve comes out. So the spinal cord lives behind the disc and the nerve root lives in the foramen. We're gonna go in and we're gonna get out to the foramen once we pass through the disc. We're gonna, we're gonna treat that herniation and clean up the tear in the back of the disc with the laser which will allow it to heal once and for all. This patient um, has had this, this tear for years, as many people do, and unfortunately, 
through the tear, the herniations have pushed out and they're gonna continue to push out through the tear until we fix the tear. So shot, you know, actually till he fixes the tear is more accurate. We cannot fix the tear. We can only clean the tear shot and uh, so the disc is under a lot of pressure. It's pushing my dilator out shot. That's from inflammation. That's, that's what the tear does is it causes inflammation. So shot. All right. So I'm kind of pinching the dilator shot. We're going to have to do a lot of shots. See, it's going to keep doing that. Um, that's why I need a lot of shots. So shot. I can't just push the tube down because it'll just biopsy the disc and I don't want to do that. Shot. All right, so I'm going to have to shot. I'm kind of pinching shot. Shot. All right, we have to advance the dilator because we need to slide the tube along the dilator. Shot. We can't just push the tube down, huh? I'm, I'm pinching it. Shot. You know, in Spanish we say pinche, shot. A little pinche, pinche, shot. Right, Luis? Just about there. I'm doing a little trick for those of you who, you can't feel my hands, but I'm actually trapping with this tube, a little torquing, trapping the dilator, shot. So. What we were seeing was the dilator kept getting pushed out like a bullet getting shot out, right? And the reason for that is the pressure inside the disc is so high from inflammation, which causes swelling. But the disc can't swell because the disc has a wall that's really strong. So how is that stuff gonna swell? So it doesn't swell, instead the pressure goes up. And as the pressure goes up, it pushes more herniation out. So this, this young man has clear evidence by the amount of pressure inside his disc pushing the dilator out that his disc is under a lot of pressure. The disc should not be under pressure. There should be zero pressure right now. And he's got a pressure of about, we could probably measure it. I wonder how we can measure it. Uh, well, we have LOR. Where, where huh? We have LOR, whatever the for that epidural, but I don't know if we can. That'd be interesting to measure the pressure. <laughs> like a tire gauge. <laughs> Dead serious. If I had to guess, I'd say, I'd say there's 25 millimeters of mercury pressure. No, you can't see. By the way, you can't see any of that on the MRI. That's why MRIs are not entirely trustworthy. You have to be careful. Yeah, some of them we've seen tremendous pressure. All right, while you're watching, feel free to ask questions. I'm going to go ahead and have um, Henry play one of our videos. This is going to show you folks why do annular tears with herniations cause um, back pain? Or sorry, in this case, neck pain. And how do they cause arm pain? And the answer is you're gonna see inflammation. Traumatic injury on the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissue develops within the annular tear causing neck pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause worsening symptoms. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to the nearby nerve roots, causing arm pain. Pain signals travel up the nerves to the brain, causing localized neck pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex causing conscious awareness of neck pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc in neck pain, 
Submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. All right, just so you know, what I'm seeing here is a lot of scar tissue. Um, I'm actually amazed at how much scar tissue, but I'm also not amazed because remember when I did the discogram a few minutes ago, I was pushing the dye in and we weren't seeing a lot. That's because it's scarred up. There's tremendous amount of scar tissue here. So the little white fluffy stuff here is annulus, but below the annulus is scar tissue. And that right there is posterior longitudinal ligament, PLL. You see how the fiber orientation is left to right, which is up and down. And I apologize for a little bit of the blurriness here. Here's a piece of herniation and scar tissue. You see the golden color? You can kind of make out a golden color where the laser's working. That's calcification inside the scar tissue associated with the herniated disc. All right. So everything's going well for this young man. Uh, he's stable, doing great. Right, doctor? Blood pressure is good, right? Yeah. He's stable completely. I know his family's in Nicaragua watching, and he has a young three and a half year old child. So I know his, the mother of his children is worried about him, and we're just shouting out to her, telling her everything's going good, he's gonna do great. But if you're listening and watching, don't let him go back to surfing too soon. I want him honestly taking a year off of surfing. So if you go back too soon, he could fall off the surfboard, hit his neck. So he may have to do something else. And I don't mean skimboarding either. That's probably even more risky than surfing. Now this disc will heal once we clean this material out here. Once we do our debridement, which is what we're doing right now, the, di the disc will heal, okay? But it needs time to heal, and I can't speed that up yet. I'm working on something to speed it up, but I don't have anything yet, okay? Looking good. Just, this is all scar tissue again from chronic inflammation from the herniation. I'm almost done, believe it or not, with this disc. This is all the material that's pushing out onto his nerves. So our first patient this morning was from uh, Washington. This patient is from Nicaragua. And um, he's actually, I believe he's an American that lives in Nicaragua and um, orig he's originally from Pennsylvania, yeah. And I know mom's here to take care of him because his, his um, I don't know if it's his wife or significant other, but she's with the babies in Nicaragua. So we're, we promised we would do a good job and take good care of them. We always do our best for every patient. See that little piece that came out? I need a five minutes on this disc and we'll be done. Now, we're gonna do things a little different because um, remember, normally the discs that we fix, if there's two, they're adjacent next to each other. This is a, a bit, of, bit of an unusual circumstance. There's some herniation where the herniations that we're fixing are apart from each other. There's some herniation right there. Now this stuff is in stained blue because the scar tissue blocked the stain from getting to it.
How's that other needle? I feel it. You can see where the herniation came from right there, guys? That little space right there? Any questions from our audience, Henry? No current que questions, but we just got a comment from uh, Brommels on YouTube, and he Hi, and he commented, "This is incredible." Yeah, thank you, Ronald. I'm glad you can appreciate the advancement here in technology and technique. It's it is incredible for honestly for the patients, their families, everyone that cares about them, just to be able to get this neck pain fixed from a herniation and not have to go through fusion, not have to go through metal, artificial discs. You know, again, you're not gonna see these surgeries promoted anywhere because there's really no implants going in, there's no metal going in. So the metal companies like the Medtronics and Diffuse, they don't, they don't want this technology out there. They don't want people knowing about it. Um, they're doing everything they can to prevent it from going out there because the, the thing is, is that when people realize they don't have to have a fusion or a metal disc, they're gonna want this surgery. And this surgery doesn't make those companies any money at this point because they've invested all their efforts into selling metal for people's spines. And this surgery takes away the need for metal. There's a piece of herniation. I'm trying to float it out, but it's pretty dense. It's wanting to sit at the bottom of the water column. So I'm trying to use a little hydrostatic pressure to shove it out the tube. Now, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm a neurosurgeon and by training, I've been trained to do artificial discs and uh, fusions and laminectomy. So I, I've been doing those surgeries for many years until I discovered the endoscopic technique from uh, overseas. And once I saw how minimally invasive the surgery was, I realized if it actually worked, the potential would be amazing. So then my focus was just on getting it to work. And, you know, the Koreans had done a good job of getting it to work on people who had arm pain from a herniated disc uh, and, and radiculopathy, which is weakness, numbness, tingling in their arm. However, they could never solve the neck pain issue or the headaches coming from the neck issue. However, I did. And it's, it has everything in the world to do with the debridement of the annulus, which is what is the hallmark of my surgery, the Duke Laser Disc Repair. So we try to get that information out to people so they understand that it's a fixable problem they have. They just need the right surgery. All right, so we've got just layers of scar tissue back here. I think this injury is several years old. So you don't get this much scar tissue you know, in five months or six months. This is years and years of accumulation. And then the scar tissue gets so thick, it acts like a tumor or a mass. You know, tumors are not cancerous always, they can be benign. So you think of this as a benign tumor putting pressure on the nerves. And uh, that's, that's where some of his weakness is coming from, is the pressure from this herniation and the scar tissue it's created as a reaction to the herniation, and that's what we're fixing right now. That's the foramen, by the way. You're seeing the foramen. You know, spine surgeons that do cervical surgery, they don't see this, because there's no tool that allows you to see inside the foramen, um, except the microscope, a very, very expensive microscope, and even then, you can't have this much of a view of the foramen, right, Luis? Oh, yeah. Luis has done many uh, microscopic surgeries as well with me and you never have this good of a view of the foramen. We're literally peeling herniation off the top of the herniation of the nerve root in the foramen. So we're pretty much done here. And that white thing right there is the side of where the spinal cord is just underneath that, another piece of herniation. So thanks, Ronald, I appreciate your comments and the fact that you can appreciate what a significant advancement this is in spine. Uh, we just want to get the word out so everybody knows.
Any other questions? No current questions, but we do have a couple more comments. Uh, this next one comes from Brommels again, and he said, I have C3, uh, C3 through 4 and C4 and 5 herniation in my cervical spine, and thankfully it's not bad enough to need surgery. My neurosurgeon guy said PT can take care of it, so I'm thankful for that. Before getting an MRI to diagnose why I was having arm pain to my fingers, I was at the ER all the time, and they said cervical radi uh, radiculopathy, so I know uh, the pain this man went through, and it sucks. Yeah, Ronald, thank you for your comments. Um, I'll be perfectly honest with you, um, if, since you're here and sharing. I would just be vigilant because uh, on all the years I treat symptomatic disc herniations, yes, the patients can get symptoms getting better where they don't have as much pain as the inflammation dies down, but it always comes back. And then it's going to start, it, uh, the story I see is that it, it comes back and then it stays at some point and never goes away. So the advantage of getting this procedure done early rather than later is that we can stop the degeneration of the disc because we're removing the source of inflammation that actually causes the degeneration. So with that, let's um, run our video showing how the Duke laser disc repair actually works. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic neck pain. The inflamed annular tear causes neck pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes arm pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. It can take up to 12 months. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Well, we just finished with the first of two discs we're repairing. And again, this patient has um, small disc herniations. You can see it on his MRI. They're not big, but they're symptomatic, causing a lot of symptoms and neck pain and arm symptoms going down into his shoulder. And basically, um, He's made the right choice to get it treated now rather than let that inflammation destroy his discs, which leads to degenerative disc disease. So now he's going to have nice discs, and five years from now, I expect the discs to be no worse off than they are today. We can't fix discs to where they go back to being 100% normal, but we can stop them from getting worse. All right. Um, we're going to move on to the next disc now. And, yep, yep, take that. And then uh, to do that, I'm going to remove this tube. You can actually see the uh, liquid I put in is not getting pushed out anymore. So that pressure in the disc is gone. We've taken care of it. And that's going to mean a lot to him in terms of recovery, getting better. So taking this guy out at um, five, six. Let's bring the fluoroscope in. The fluoroscope is our x-ray machine. It helps me navigate to the tear in the back of the disc where the herniation comes through. It also allows me to localize to get the right disc to fix. The determination of which discs that are herniated or which discs that are causing patient symptoms, that's based on a combination of the physical exam and the MRI scan. 
And once I've identified the proper disc to fix, then we, we go in and fix them with the laser surgery. So let me just show you, we've, we've taken one of our, uh, we've taken the tube out at five, six. There's the incision. Can you all see that? Yep. I mean, literally, uh, it almost looks like a biopsy incision. It's just four millimeters, so no bleeding. His neck is supple. This is the future of spine surgery, folks. You're seeing it right now, today. today. Dr. Berndez loves that. The future of spine surgery today here at Duke Spine Institute. And our last patient who's just getting ready to go home right now, I have to just say hi to him. Um, you know, he went to the top universities in the country in the United States, UC San Francisco and some of the other Hopkins who, who, where he used to work and nobody there does this type of surgery. They're all still doing metal, 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 metal. And I'll tell you, a large reason for that is um, that the metal companies, the companies that sell the metal implants, that's it right there? They uh, shot, they've infiltrated our teaching centers and basically have corrupted the educational system and taking it from a scientific process to a, uh, a business and commercial enterprise shot. And that should not be how medicine is conducted in any country shot. Of course you have to make money, but at the same time, the priority should be patient health and healthcare and shot doing what's best for the people, not what's best for the big companies. And unfortunately, healthcare has been in the United States, just in general, and probably around the world, more developed countries, has been um, taken over by basically um, financiers, bankers, um, people, money people. And healthcare decisions are being made by money people rather than by, you know, the principles of doctors and medicine that have been around for hundreds of years and have always prioritized the patient's well being. So that's the system we exist in. That's why. People ask me, why isn't the surgery done more by more doctors? Because it's a, it's, they're basically imprisoned within a, a culture that is uh, controlled by, by uh, money and high profits by selling metal. All right, we all agree that's three, four? So I'm just making my way down gently, carefully. Uh, I don't want the guide wire going in any further. Sean? So we're passing the esophagus right now. Sean? Sean? Okay, we're just about to the front of the spine. I can feel it now. Sean? Right. Sean? You can see my guide wire is right up against the back of the bone there at C3. My, my dilator is at the front of the disc now, right where the anterior longitudinal ligament is. And I'm gonna take my guide wire back a little bit. And now I'm going to shot. Now remember, we put the dye in this disc a while ago, so it's already gone. You can see just a faint trace of it left. All right, so we're at the front of the disc. I'm gonna tap this in gently through the an, uh, annulus in the front. And now I'm inside the nucleus, I can feel it. And we've already done our discogram. I'm gonna go to the back of the disc once again, where the tear is, the symptomatic tear. And people ask me, aren't you making a hole in the front of the disc? No, um, we, we didn't cut anything. We're spreading the fibers. Unlike the skin, where we actually have to make a hole we, we don't make a hole in the annulus because it's fibrous. It has, uh, it's, it's like strands of string, you know, tight string. And we're going between those strands. I have a little stickiness of my glove due to the contrast. Shot. All right, so I want to bring the tube down, the tubular dilator. I need a little irrigation on my gloves. They're just too sticky. What makes these gloves sticky yeah, is uh, the contrast dye, which is the stuff we use to, to do the discogram. It's one of the 
components of that juice that we inject shot. All right, so we're getting close, almost there, taking our time. This is the part I like to twist the tube a lot because I don't want it catching on anything. Shot. All right. And you can feel the front of the spine. I'm bumping up against it right now. And I think what's, what's holding me back is I made my hole in the skin a little small, but it's actually nice. It's at about four and a half millimeters shot. Okay, at this point we are ready to pass through. Yeah, the fascia is holding me back, so just do a little more twisting and we should be good. Shot, really good. All right, now we're gonna go forward with our tube shot. I'm going to keep an eye on the dilator again. If that dilator starts coming back, shot, like it did in the other disc, then I'm going to have to stop and re-advance it. You must slide down the dilator with the tube. You cannot, so the pressure in this disc is not as bad. You cannot uh, put the tube down without a dilator in the middle. You will biopsy the disc. You don't want to do that. Biopsy is not a good thing. You, want, you do that if you're worried about cancer or something but you don't biopsy a normal disc. We want to keep as much nuclear material as we can. That's the cushion between the bones. Any questions? Sean? Yes, we have multiple questions. Multiple? Yes. Um, this one, um, someone has answered in the comments, but I'm going to read both of them. Uh, the, fir the question is, uh, is from Joseph on Facebook. And um, he said, I've seen a lot of negative comments on, online on Duke Spine Institute. How do, how do I go to your institute with, uh, with confidence? And the reply was from DM Maker on Facebook. <laughs> and DM Maker replied back, uh, talk to his patients, watch the testimonials, and watch the live surgeries. Every surgery is so consistent. I am a happy patient. I've had this surgery 15 months ago. Couldn't be happier. You are welcome to contact me uh, directly. Good luck. Well, I appre appreciate DM Maker who, you know, I, I can't talk about DM Maker because he is a patient. I won't say anything, but he can talk. Look, uh, the negative comments. If you go back and look at the negative comments, they are 100% of the time made by people who couldn't afford to do the surgery. And when you can't afford medical care, that's a problem between the patient and their insurance company. Not, it's not the doctor's fault or the surgeon's fault that your insurance doesn't pay for what you need done. That's honestly your fault for being, and I will put tongue in my cheek, you know, being the one who bought the insurance plan and got suckered into it, right? So insurance companies are not there to help you. They're there to make money on you. And the way they make money on people is by not paying for their medical care. It's called a denial. It's very simple. And, you know, rewind the clock back into the 70s, there were no denials. Denials didn't exist. There were maybe a few thousand a year in the whole United States. Now we have millions of denials every day by insurance companies, not wanting to pay for an MRI, not wanting to pay for x-rays, not wanting to pay for therapy, not wanting to pay the chiropractors. They have cut back on what they pay. Why? Because it's profitable to deny care. So when patients come here and find out their insurance doesn't have a contract to pay for the surgery, you know, uh, that they need or treatment they need, they get up, some of them get upset and they blame the wrong person. They blame the doctor. Why? Well, because they've been misinformed. That's the short answer. And I'm sorry, but um, we don't have bad outcomes ever. We don't have bad results. We just have people that are unhappy because they have to pay out of pocket for their medical care. So if you look at all those comments you're talking about, it's always, I went there and I had to pay $30,000 or $36,000. Well, you know what? You should be writing a comment about your sucky insurance. That's what you should be talking about because it's your insurance that's the reason you have to pay, not us. So don't get angry with us for p being pioneers in healthcare, giving you better healthcare, safer healthcare. Be angry with your insurance company 
for being the blood-sucking parasites that they are. I would love to go to these people's insurance website and look and see if they've written a bad comment about their insurance for not wanting to pay for the surgery. Okay? So these are the most hypocritical people. Their comments are baseless, and I don't give any credibility or credence to them. Now, there are some comments about, oh, I went there and I had to wait for a few hours. You're right. Why, did, why is that? The answer is simple. We don't have enough staff. Why is that? The answer is simple. There's a cultural problem in the United States where people think they don't need to work anymore, and they just sit back and take paychecks from the government for not working. Okay? So we have some of those people that get hired, and then next thing you know, they disappear, and we, we're out. Uh, and so then there's backup of patient care because we don't have enough staff. So if you want to fix that problem, stop complaining about the wait time. Come work for us. Come over here and volunteer your services to help other people get care faster. Okay? So the only comments you're ever going to see about Duke Spine that's negative is, number one, their insurance doesn't cover some treatment that we offer because it's state-of-the-art. Number two, they had to wait too long, and that's because of staffing issues out of our control. Or number three, Dr. Duke Majin is just an asshole. You know, he's, he's a, not a nice person, which is complete horseshit. I am a very nice person, but I'm not going to suck your ass. I'm going to actually tell you how it really is. That's the one thing God didn't give me was the ability to kiss people's ass. So don't expect me to kiss asses. But I will lay out the truth the way it is. All right? My staff know not to expect me to ass kiss. That right there is a herniation. It came out from a tear in the back of the disc. It's blue, stained blue, because it's degenerated. All right, what's the next uh, lovely comment from our viewers? Next comment uh, comes from Dr. Alas Al Al Hazmi, and he said, "My regard uh, from Dr. Or to Dr. Hazalmi from Dubai to Dr. Duke." Oh, thank you so much, Doctor. It's a pleasure, and I look forward to working with you. Uh, uh, I'm very excited. So I hope we're going to be able to to uh, to do what's needed to to achieve greatness. All right. Thank you for the comment. We have another question. I hope they don't translate that my last statements into. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they speak English, but uh, it is what it is. I'm not ashamed of my uh, comments at all. Other people should be. Of theirs. Go ahead. And this question's. Uh, ah, this question comes from Sago on YouTube. And Sago said, "Hi, Dr. Duke." If someone has had a cervical disc herniation but is uh, poor, what is the remedy of crime because you can't afford Duke laser disc repair? Yeah, great question. So s this is a great question. Someone has a cervical disc herniation. They don't have the money to pay for it. Um, there's several ways. I mean, there's, listen, I if you want me to pay for it, I can't, okay? I can do the surgery, but I can't pay for your surgery. So you have to find an alternative source of payment. And you know, if you, if you have a senator you want to write to to get help, if you have a congressman, if you want to do a GoFundMe page, if you want to borrow money, if you want to go to church, ask your church, synagogue, you know, whoever, religious body that if they could help you, if they could you know, s raise money for you, um, if you have to go and, and work and save your money so you can pay for it, um, you know, uh, if you want some ideas, go watch a movie called Fun with Dick and Jane. Fun with Dick and Jane. That's, there's some ideas there. I won't say anything more. But there's, you know, there's a lot of money in the world. And there are people who have money and they want to help people like you get better. But they just don't know where to, to do it. They don't know how to do it. I've always said this publicly, uh, not publicly, maybe privately. But if Elon Musk ever came here for his surgery, I would make him donate $100 million into an account, and that money would only go to helping indigent people who don't have the money to pay for their surgery. And I wouldn't operate on him unless he did it. So 
I'm a champion of the people, but I can't afford to pay for everybody's care. Uh, that's the one thing I can't do. I'm not super rich like Elon Musk or Bill Gates. You got guys like Elon Musk and Bill Gates who are always talking about helping other people. They have charities and foundations. Well, they need to spend some of that money somewhere where it really matters, paying for people's medical care that need it. You know, someone who has a herniated disc in their neck and is incapacitated, they can't do their work, they can't live a normal life. I'm sure that person would be very grateful for a person who donates money. Um, and my offer is, look, if you want to donate money for people to get these types of surgeries when they can't afford it, do it. We'll create a board. The board will review all the uh, applicants of people. You know, maybe we have to look at your taxes and what kind of taxes you file to make sure that the, that the foundation is paying for people who really need the financial support. But I cannot pay for people's medical care. So, you know, unfortunately, if we don't collect the money from the patient or their insurance, then where is it going to come from? And the insurance companies will lie sometimes and say, we'll pay you, and then they don't pay us. And then we're out, you know, a lot of money. And the person who pays that is me. I have to pay for the surgery out of my own pocket. So I didn't go into medicine to pay for people's surgery. I went into medicine to fix people, but the insurance companies are supposed to pay. So if you can't afford to pay yourself, there's lots of other sources of revenue and money, including GoFundMe, including very rich people that probably want to help and they will help anonymously. Uh, but you know, I'm not a financial consultant and it's not my job or my purpose in life to help people get money. My job in life is to fix people's pain. And I think I've done a damn good job of that. Nobody else worries about it or does it. All these other doctors just give you shots that don't work, that may last for a, a few weeks, but nobody else has ever invested their own time and effort to come up with a cure to chronic neck and back pain. I did. I spent years and I actually spent millions and millions of my own dollars to do it that I've never been paid back on, never. And I never will be paid back. And I don't want to be paid back. I'm not trying to get paid back. I just want to help more people, but I can't pay for their care. So you ask a great question, but I don't have a great answer, except uh, you know the things that you've probably already thought about. Family, friends, church, religious organizations, GoFundMe, um, go write some letters to Bill Gates, or, or what's his name? Uh, um, Je uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk ask them for help. There's a lot of rich people in the world. They got more money than they will ever need for themselves. Unfortunately, I'm not one of them. And, uh, and talk to them and ask them for help. That's my advice. Or talk to your politicians. You know, it's your politician's job to care for you. That's, that's you hired them, elected them to represent your best interests. And they're not doing that. They let the insurance companies not pay for things. Shame on them. That's not in your best interest, OK? So you need to hold your, rep your, your uh, elected officials accountable for their failed promises to represent your best interests. Yeah, so not a great answer for you, I'm sure, but it is the answer. And I'm not ashamed at all of the fact that I can't loan you the money for your surgery. You know, I used to feel really bad about it. And then I realized it's people's own fault for letting the insurance companies not pay for your medical care. And just so you understand the Duke laser disc repair, this surgery is not the only uh, procedure or treatment that the insurance companies try not to pay for. They do it for lots of things. You know, artificial disc, for example. When artificial disc first came out in the United States, they had already been out in Europe for like 30 years, but for them to get accepted into the United States through the FDA, it was around 2002 or 2003 or 4 when the FDA finally approved them. Well, the insurance companies weren't paying for those either. And people that wanted the artificial disc instead of a fusion, they would have to go and pay for it out of their own pocket. Five minutes, maybe 10. And so um, they would pay for artificial discs out of their own pocket and then they would sue their insurance companies to get the insurance to pay. We're gonna do the same thing, trust me. We're already doing it. We're in the process. 
So the reality is, is we are going after the insurance companies to get them to pay, but unfortunately, I have to do that too, and that's a huge task. If you think curing back a neck pain was hard to do, I've also figured out why all the coral reefs are dying on my own free time, out of my own dime. I've discovered the cause, and yet I have no support from anyone to help create a, a solution. So this is just the way the world is, unfortunately. I can't fix it. All I can do is raise awareness about it. All right, great point. I appreciate you saying it. And uh, that's the best answer I can give you today. We have a couple more questions. Of course. Uh, this next question comes from Joseph once more on Facebook. And he asked, are there any lo other locations in the USA that has the same techniques as Duke Spine? Hey, Joseph, great question. Uh, I'm not aware of any. Um, you know, this technique I pioneered from endoscopic spine surgery, which was already being done by the Koreans and a German surgeon, but they don't do what I do. They don't use the laser, for example, usually. They and they don't do an annular debridement. The annular debridement is literally part of the Duke laser disc repair created by me, pioneered by me. So the answer is I don't know who else is doing it. I have surgeons all the time contacting me on social media from other countries saying they watch my surgery, they're starting to do my surgery. Over in India, China, um, and I'm happy for them but they haven't been trained by me, and um, I can't vouch for their technique or their success. And I would certainly be very cautious about going anywhere else but Duke Spine Institute. This is, I make these surgeries look easy, but the reality is, is they're not easy, okay? They are actually very, very sophisticated and technical surgeries, and there's, uh, what would you say, a thousand things that have to be controlled for easily, right? And the patients, a thousand things in the uh, operating room and preoperatively that we have to control for in order to do it. So, you know, to be honest with you, the amount of money we charge is a, is a bargain uh, for these surgeries for the patients. It's not expensive at all compared to what we put into it. Um, but we want to make it affordable. And so that's why we, we charge what we charge and not more. But we should be charging more. Spinal fusions cost a lot more. Did I answer the question? I believe so. Uh, we have a, another question. Sure. This comes from Dr. Santosh uh, Tri Tripathi from India. And uh -huh. there's one of the surgeons doing my procedure, I think. And he, has, uh, he asks, I am not getting this end, uh, endosco endoscope anywhere. So what other endoscope can I use for this surgery, sur uh, for the <laughs> surgery? Hi, the Dr. Tripathi. Yeah, the problem, you're right, is uh, the company that manufactured this scope stopped making it. Um, and I've talked to them, but they don't listen. That's just another example of stubborn ignorance. Um, I don't know what other scope you can use, sir. I, I'm sorry, you know, to be quite honest with you, I don't have an answer for you, but this is a special scope. Uh, it's a fiber optic, and it's, uh, 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 the company that makes it, Wolf, in Germany, they refused to uh, keep making it for me, and they're just stupid, honestly, stupid people. But we need, um, yeah, we need a good source for these scopes. That's a great point. By the way, this is interesting. You can see the tear here is mostly on the, this side right there. And there's a little bit of uh, disc and, and stuff here. It just goes to show that annular tears are not always in the center of the annula. Sometimes they're closer to the end plate. Yeah, I'm sorry, doctor. I wish I could tell you an answer, but I, I bought all these scopes years ago. I spent all the money and uh, I honestly have not found somebody to make the scopes. So if you find somebody, I have to ask you for your advice 
on where to get more scopes. Keep it to your side. Yeah, I need about three minutes, maybe, and I'll be done. I just want to go back and look at the other side of the uh, back of the disc. Well, there you have it. I think, doctor, you asked the question, who else does these? And I think that doctor there from India, I'm not sure, where are you from in India, doctor? Is it Mumbai? Well, we'll find out. Yes, currently waiting on an answer. Waiting on him to answer? Yeah. But we do have another question. Yep, let's go to that. And this comes from Joseph on Facebook once more. Joe. And he said, um, uh, does the Banati spine employ the same procedures as Duke's? Great question. Does the Banati spine employ the same procedure as Duke? No. 100% not. I won't make any other comments besides that. But um, the Duke laser disc repair, what you're watching is done here. I'm not gonna make any other comments uh, for reasons I cannot discuss. And Dr. Santos replied back, he said uh, Gwalior, which is close to Delhi. Ah, very nice. Very nice, doctor. Well, I'm sorry I can't be more helpful to you, doctor. I really would love for you to have the right equipment, trust me. It makes all the difference in the world. As a matter of fact, I won't even do surgery unless I know I have the best equipment available. I need one minute and we're done. What's the issue? Everything okay? Any other questions? No current questions. We are done. Uh, you can see where the herniation was down here and on the other side, it's gone. Um, I'm out in the foramen. There's just a little bit of foramenal ligament there. Uh, let me just swing around one more time to look in case something has sneaked in like that piece right there. We'll float it out. What you may not be seeing folks is the irrigation going on inside the tube but you can see things floating around. That's because there's irrigation constantly cycling in and out. Okay. Scope off. Scope off, please. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. What was that? Huh. All right. So go ahead and type up your questions for me. And while I'm uh, making my way over to the broadcasting room to answer your questions for you, would you mind showing our audience the difference between the open cervical fusion surgery that most surgeons do versus uh, the Duke laser disc repair. I'm going to quickly show you guys the two incisions, okay? So you can see how small they are. We have a light. So this is essentially a bloodless surgery. We've, we've lost virtually no blood and maybe a few drops. If you cut yourself shaving uh, your legs or your face, you probably bleed more than this surgery. So we've never done a blood transfusion. There's no need. We've never had a hematoma or a blood clot. Um, what is that? As I'm saying, we ne never had a blood yeah. clot. I'm looking at your number, thinking, my God, this may be the first one. Please verify. All right, look at that. So honestly, it looks like he came to Florida and met a vampire, right? He's got the two teeth marks. Somebody was hungry. It's almost Halloween, so it's perfect. He's going to be able to go around saying, you know, he was just minding his own business at Disney when uh, suddenly he felt something on his neck. And next thing you know, he looked up and it was Dr. Duke Majin. <laughs> All right, but there's no blood to suck because there's no blood. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed watching this. Um, the surgery went perfect for this young man. And, you know, everybody's disc is a little different. None of them are the same. You can see if you go back and watch them all, 
these surgeries. We do the surgery the same way, but the, uh, the disc injuries are always different. What was interesting in his case is that we had a lot of pressure in the disc, um, the first disc, which was the 5.6, from all the inflammation. But the second disc didn't have that pressure. It just had a, uh, the tear which we and the herniations. So it was probably on its way to having more inflammation. But this is an inflammatory disease, folks. It's not a structural compressive etiology. It's inflammation. All right, type up your questions and I'll be there shortly. Go ahead and run the video. Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke Laser Disc Repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke Laser Disc Repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke Laser Disc Repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke Laser Disc Repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke Laser Disc Repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke Laser Disc Repair Surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke Laser Disc Repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. The Duke Laser Disc Repair patient is soon back home enjoying life with a very fast recovery allowing normal activities without pain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke Laser Disc Repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. 
a large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, Patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke laser disc repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke laser disc repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke laser disc repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke laser disc repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke laser disc repair, normal movements of the joint in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke laser disc repair. In fact, most Duke laser disc repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke laser disc repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke laser disc repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spinal surgery in the world for the treatment of symptomatic damaged discs causing back pain, neck pain, sciatica, and radiculopathy due to herniated, degenerated, or bulging discs. I think the laser is the best thing out there to help with this type of surgery. Um, it's all legit. That's all I can say about it. Dr. Duke Majin here at the Duke Spine Institute. I'm with one of my patients who has traveled to us from Mississippi. And he came here for the Duke laser disc repair to be done for a herniated disc on his neck. And he's now here today, just one day after surgery. How are you feeling today? Feeling great. I feel like the weight of the world has been lifted off my shoulders. Feels a lot less pain in my shoulder, no more tingling. Feels like my body's trying to recover back to normal. I think the surgery went very well, no problem whatsoever. And you're just one day after surgery. Can you tell whether the neck pain is gone yet? The neck pain is gone and the pain throughout my shoulder, the tingling, everything is gone. A little soreness in my throat. My, my voice is a little harsh, but other than that, I feel great. Awesome. Can you show us your incision? Oh wow, look at that. So you have a four millimeter incision. You can see that right here on the surgical footage of the endoscope. We actually, um, when you watch the video, you can see all the herniated discs back there. We were pulling them out one at a time. You had about 20 pieces. And then you can see the nerve root right there in the foramen. And there's no herniated discs anymore on the nerve root. We got them all out of there. I had to open up the posterior longitudinal ligament and get all those fragments of disc herniation out of the epidural space that we're pushing on your nerve. And I got a good look at everything and it looked fantastic. So I think you're going to do great. Did you consider having like a fusion surgery? Did anyone offer you fusion before? Yes, I was offered fusion. I was told that was the only surgery that could be done. I started Googling. I come across the laser surgery <clears throat> and I decided to, to give it a try <clears throat> and I don't regret it. I think it was the best decision I ever made for my age and I think the outcome would be a lot more better in the future and it was a great experience, it really was. 
And you, you work with metal as your job, so you didn't want metal in your neck on your spine. No, I think the cold weather would have an effect on it. I think it would have caused an adjacent effect, is what they call it. Um, when you do the fusion, it make the disc below it or above it wear out. And I'm 34 years old, and if I live another 30 years, I just feel like it would cause significant problems. I think the laser is the best thing out there to have with this type of surgery. Um, it's all legit. That's all I can say about it. All right, welcome to this broadcast, our second surgery for the day on September 8, 2022 at Duke Spine Institute. We have just broadcasted our second um, patient that had really two herniated discs that were causing symptoms in the neck. And most doctors would have characterized those discs as disc bulges. Uh, but disc bulges are still herniations. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what exactly is happening but when it comes to a, a disc herniation or a disc bulge there's quite literally um, 10 different ways of saying the same thing but I'm looking for my model of my disc which I can't find um, basically the disc has only two parts so it's quite simple okay there's there's really a not a lot of complexity to it. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. The disc has two parts. It's got a, a wall around it that's really strong and fibrous. Remember, it has the fibers. We go through those fibers to get in there. And then it's got almost a silicone jelly type material in the center called the nucleus propulsus. And the first thing that has to happen with all disc abnormalities is the wall tears. It's called an annulus tear or annulus fibrosis tear, abbreviated annular tear, okay? So the annulus gets ripped open and that comes from a sudden jarring like a car accident where you whip your head forward or fall or um, some type of sudden whipping movement, uh, whether it's rotational or flexion extension like this or this or this or lateral bending. There's probably a lateral component to it. Nobody knows exactly the mechanism, but there's some type of a whip traumatic injury and then you drop your paper clip and then I have to fish it out from underneath my feet. Sorry about that. <laughs> Doesn't want to comply. Oh, give me a second. Sorry. So once a tear happens in the back of the disc, now there's a passage for the jelly to escape and the jelly in the center pushes through the tear. and. Um, when that happens, it's called, a, again, a herniated disc. That's, if we could just eliminate all other names, you know, slip disc is common, protruding disc, rupture disc, um, extruded disc, and uh, the list goes on and on. Bulging disc. So all those things are the same thing. It's a herniation. What, what, what's different in each case is, and it's not each case, just what's really the difference is whether it's small, we call it contained if it's below the lig uh, posterior ligament, and um, extruded, which means it's gone past the posterior longitudinal ligament. So contained versus non-contained, um, but the truth is none of that matters. What really matters is the fact there's a tear and a herniation. And the next thing that matters is, is the patient having symptoms from that? And those symptoms are neck pain, pain going from the neck and the shoulder called cervical brachial pain, pain going down the arm called radicular pain, and then weakness, numbness, and tingling in the hands. So that's called radiculopathy. Uh, and then myelopathy, which is dysfunction of the spinal cord, if it's pushing on the spinal cord or irritating the spinal cord, and then what are called cervicogenic headaches, which is headaches in the back from irritation of the dura. So that's all that matters. And doctors need to start focusing on what matters. 
What matters is what the patient is experiencing and what we can fix. And once you've identified the patient has a symptoms from this and it's interfering with their quality of life, their work, their ADLs, um, their interpersonal relationships, you should fix it. And the way you should fix it is with the Duke laser disc repair, what we just saw today. Why? You saw those two little incisions. There's no need for metal screws and rods, cages. You can actually see the cages. I'll show you this. This is what a cage looks like. Y'all see that? Yeah. So the disc lives between these two bones called the vertebral body. And we went through the disc using a skinny little tube to the back there. And then I used a laser to zap away the herniation back here and clean out the tear. But other surgeons, they all take the whole disc out just to get to the little piece in the back and then pop it out with a curette. And then they got to put a spacer where the disc was. I made out of plastic or metal. And then they got to put in screws and rods and plates and fuse it. If you look at this one, this is an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. You can actually see the cage right there. You guys, uh, let's see. Do you see well. that right there? Yeah. Nice and crisp. There's another one right there. Those are cages. They're there because the disc was removed. We don't do that with the Duke laser disc repair. We leave your disc alone and you get to keep your natural disc. We're just repairing the back of it. This is the standard, this should be the standard of care everywhere. But the problem is, is I can't get spine surgeons to stop putting metal in because they're making so much money doing it and they're making money for their partners, the uh, implant companies. Anyway, we're coming to you because I think people don't want this metal in their neck and they should know they have an alternative. Um, you know, we had a question about insurance. Unfortunately, some insurances won't pay for the surgery. Some, some insurances will say they'll pay and then they don't pay on the back end once we do it. We cannot take that risk. So we're in the process and it's, is a, it's been 16 years so far that we've started trying to work with the insurance companies. We've gotten a lot of them to cover the surgery willingly because they see the value in it and saving money and they see the value in terms of outcomes being better, and they see the value in terms of no complications that they have to pay for. They see the value in a rapid return to work for the patient. So all that matters to the insurance companies, and they're finally starting to understand. But I will be honest with you. The truth is, if you have a herniated disc and you're told you need a fusion, that fusion is gonna scare you away. And that's what the insurance companies want. They want you scared to get a fusion, which you should be, by the way. Why? Because then you won't get the fusion and they save their $100,000 and they don't have to make that payment to the hospital and the surgeon. So by allowing the insurance companies allow and only pay for scary surgery, they know you're going to be too scared to get it done, which means they don't have to say no to you. You say no to yourself. And that's the best thing an insurance company can do is when their beneficiary doesn't feel cheated out of what they paid for. And so when you say no to fusion, you, the insurance company does this because they just saved a hundred thousand dollars to go to their bottom line. We've watched insurance company profits go like this up, 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 up every year. Why? Because they're denying more treatment. They're basically, forcing people to have barbaric types of treatment to get coverage. They know, the insurance companies know, that when the Duke laser disc repair becomes something they're forced to pay for through the court system, it's gonna happen soon, that they're gonna be stuck paying those bills and there's gonna be more people wanting it done, a lot more. So, right now we're in a, unfortunately in a bad place for everybody because people are having to pay money out of pocket to get it done while we go after the insurance companies to get them to pay, all right? Now, I would say probably 20% of the insurance companies we deal with pay for it and they pay for it willingly. The other 80% of the plans we have to fight. Now, people are gonna say, well, what about Blue Cross? The truth is we get some of the Blue Cross plans that pay and some that don't. There are over a thousand plans in Blue Cross in the United States. They have micro plans in every different state, every different county. They offer three or four. It depends on the employer. So they've got all these Blue Cross plans. Literally, I'm not joking, about a thousand of them. So probably around, I'm guessing, 
maybe 10% of those plans will actually pay up front, or not pay up front, but agree up front and pay the bill for, those sur for the laser surgery. The other 90% are managed by adjusters who say, no, we're not gonna pay because they're trying to save money, okay? So that's the problem is we don't have a contract right now with the insurance company, so we don't have predictability. But I'll be honest, even if you have a contract, they still screw doctors and hospitals by not paying. So even if you have a contract with the hospital and Blue Cross, Blue Cross will still deny 20% of the payments, okay? They do that because that's how they save money, by not paying. And then they make the hospital have to call them and sit on the phone for an hour to try to get payment. So they know that a lot of people will give up, you know, and they just keep their money. All right, well, the surgery went very well. Our patient is, uh, I think, gonna be very happy. And I will tell you, I saw the first patient. He's doing amazing. He's the one from uh, Washington. And I just checked his arms. He had weakness yesterday before surgery. Now the strength is back to 100%, except for finger extension on the right, which he has, uh, when I checked it, he has about four plus. He doesn't have five. But all the other places he was weak in his arms, back to normal. And he's going home to a hotel where he'll be back tomorrow and hopefully we'll see him with a testimonial. All right, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, so first one, this is uh, the follow-up answer from uh, Dr. Santos from India on YouTube, um, talking about the endoscopic lasers. And he said, the closest scope that I could find is, the com uh, is a compact uh, hys hysteroscope by Wolf. It's zero degree, uh, but the problem is the sheath and, is the sheath and arturator? Obturator. Yeah, sheath and obturator. Yeah. Dilator. Yeah. Okay, well, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'm sure if it's a cystoscope, it's too long as well. It's probably very awkward for you to use. They are cheap, though. You know, they're under $1,000. The scopes that I have, Dr. Uh, Santos, I paid $12,000 a piece. The scope you're using is probably, if it's used, it's probably $100, $200. So there's a huge difference in the scopes. I think yours is probably a rod lens configuration, but it's probably too long. So it makes it awkward for you to use. Um, yeah, I don't want to tell you, except that the, the scope that we use at Duke Spine is no longer manufactured by Wolf. That will maybe change someday, um, I'm hoping, but um, they're very difficult to deal with. Very difficult to deal with. They, they just, Weird, just weird people. Okay, next question. Uh, two more. The first one is a comment. This comes from Joseph. He just said, so far I am very impressed by uh, your video and your responses to my questions. I have sent my disc and reports to Duke and I'm waiting, uh, awaiting the responses. Thank you for your candid responses. Yeah, Joe, no problem. Um, thank you for being here and for, for watching and commenting. So listen, I, you bring up a great point I need to talk about. Unfortunately, at Duke Spine, we suffer the same problems every other business does. We have employees that commit to doing the job and then suddenly they're, they're walking off the job, ghosting us, okay, literally ghosting. The problem is if you ghost a job at White Castle Burger, so the burger doesn't get made, right? Somebody else comes in and makes the burger. But when you ghost at a medical clinic where there are patients that are suffering and needing help and needing your help and you just ghost the job, well, guess what? All those people now have to wait and they suffer longer. So um, I apologize if there's delays on anybody out there watching. We've had a ghost happen again. We had two ghosts in a row. The first one was Joe Larson's son, Flynn Larson, who ghosted the job and left 20 people hanging that day when he didn't show up to work. And then we had it ghosted by Darcy. So, um, yeah, Darcy just didn't even show up to work. And we had 15 telemeds that day. So my team, including Henry and Luis and um, yours truly, we all scrambled to get those telemeds done on Tuesday. And I think we have some tomorrow as well. But the reality is, is we're going to get back online. We're going to get back on track. I hired, a, I think, a very emotionally and psychologically stable person. Uh, Sam and she's tough and I love tough people because um, when tough people get it in their head about what's right 
they are like a pit bull. They just keep going until it gets done properly. And Sam, I've worked with her for six months. She's run my clinic. She's uh, graciously agreed to take over the MRI reviews and telemeds job. And I trust her and she's gonna do a great job. She won't ghost us. So for all the people that have been waiting, and, and by the way, this is an interesting thing I'll share with you. It's September 8, 2022. You know, when we started doing the free MRI reviews about a year ago, we were getting maybe five a week. And then about six months ago, we were at 10 a week. Now we're at 10 to 15 a day. And honestly, it's gonna go up from there. I just don't see any stopping. Our web volume is going up at Duke Spine and our, our MRI review requests are going up. So we are in the process of basically improving that process to make it more efficient for everybody so that people get their submission in and they get seen that same week. But right now we, it's, you know, it's rough because the people that come and commit and work here and we train them and they, they tell us they're gonna do the job and then they just don't show up. They take an easier job somewhere else for maybe more money. Um, and it puts everybody out. So, you know, it is what it is. And I'm sorry for the people that are waiting, but um, we're doing the best we can given everything we have. And um, I think someday we're, we're not gonna have these problems anymore. So bear with us. And thanks for submitting your MRI, Joe. And uh, just stick with it and we'll get to it, okay? And last but not least, this comes from Nucleus on YouTube. Nucleus, I love it. Nice name, Nucleus, very <laughs> cool, I like it. And they asked, uh, hello, Dr. Duke, from your experience, is there, I think you answered it from uh, prior, but from your experience, is there uh, an insurance company that you would recommend? Many have, many have informed me that I will ha have to pay out, uh, pay out of pocket. Unfortunately, I am from California. Nucleus. I love the name. I don't know if it's the nucleus of a atom or the nucleus of a family or the nucleus of a disc, but it's cool. Um, very cool name. So is there an insurance company I'd recommend? The answer is no. Why? Simply because none of them are predictable in terms of pain. So here's what we, we do. We, we will see a patient, make recommendation, we submit for what's called prior authorization, where you know every doctor does the same thing, whether they're ordering an MRI or a procedure. We get onto the um, website for the insurance company and we start a, a authorization claim where the girls like Sheena will get in and put in your information and what procedure we wanna do. And then we wait for their decision. Now we also submit what's called um, uh, for a request for uh, medical necessity, which is another name for it is a predetermination. So there's two parts to every, you know, getting everything approved and, and, and hopefully paid for. There's prior authorization and there's prior certification. Prior authorization basically verifies the patient has an insurance plan, that it's still active and it covers things. Prior certification means we're asking the insurance company to agree in advance before we provide the surgery or treatment that they're gonna pay for that surgery or treatment based on the diagnosis, okay? So we go for that on everybody beforehand and generally it gets denied and we then have to fight it. But we're, we're now taking a different strategy where we're starting to fight it on everybody. And for the people who want the laser surgery but can't afford to put a deposit down, which is needed to go forward, those people are being put into a group that we're gonna be basically going back to the insurance company saying, hey, your reasons for denying it are unacceptable. They are not, um, I don't wanna let the cat out of the bag here, but they're not legal, legally appropriate, and that you're basically inappropriately, illegally denying, not illegal as in criminal, but illegal as in you have a contract and you're denying this person treatment that is the standard of care, it's medically necessary and indicated. The insurance companies are so slippery. They have literally the politicians writing all the laws in the states, the state laws, and if it's ERISA, it's federal, and they've written these laws, the insurance companies, because nobody really pays attention to laws, right? I mean, how, do you, how many of you guys actually go out and lobby your congressman or senator, hey, make sure that law is written properly? We don't do that. 
nobody does it but guess who does it the insurance companies do it oh my god do they do it they spend billions of dollars lobbying the politicians with lobbyists who they pay a lot of money to who then take this politician out and buy them a steak dinner you know feed them some money like hunter biden sorry i just got political <laughs> Anyway, I just use that example because everyone's talking about it, but I'm not going to say anything other than, you know, corruption exists in government, and um, the old Disney movie Aladdin was my favorite because the the golden rule is he who has the gold makes the rules. You remember that line in Aladdin? Yeah, yeah. And so, unfortunately, the people with the gold in this country are insurance companies, and they have more than gold you know they got crazy crazy amounts of money so they control the political agenda of every state and they write the laws while we're all having fun on TikTok, doing videos of dancing and whatever we're doing they're in the they're in the capital of every state working with the politicians to write the laws to let them have insurance plans that let them not pay for your medical care and they've been doing this for the last 40 years sneakily well we're not paying attention they've infiltrated and poisoned unfortunately our political system to allow them to deny care for you know specific reasons and now everything is swept into that reason so I'm sorry for the long-winded answer but I'm a big believer in truth and knowledge and I believe power to the people I think um, I'm here for the people I'm not here for the insurance companies. I'm here, not here for the hospitals. I'm here for you and people that are suffering. And I've learned to not rely on other people to do the job. I had to do it myself. So that said, I recognize I can't do it all by myself. I need help. And that help has to come from you guys, the people that need it, the people, the real people. So you got to rise up. You got to be proactive. I don't have all the answers. I really don't. I don't know how to get the politicians to do what's right. Um, I personally don't like politicians at all because they're liars for the most part. And if they were just honest with people, then people could know what's coming, you know, and prepare for it. You know, when a tsunami is coming, you want to know so you can go prepare. When a hurricane's coming, we want to know so we can prepare. You don't want to find out the hurricane's coming when it's there. And there's a hurricane coming in healthcare. It's already like it's already hitting, like the first winds are hitting and it's destroying our healthcare system. The United States has gone from number one worldwide, now it's down at 31 or 32. It's like the bottom. Why? Because all the money we're pumping into the healthcare is not going to patient care, it's going to these rich people, these rich companies, they're just sucking it out, just sucking it like a, a leech, sucking it out. I'm talking about the EMR companies, all right? We're talking about Epic, you know, sucking billions of dollars that should be going to taking care of people, helping them in the hospital get care. Instead, it's being paid to Epic for electronic medical records. whoop de freaking do I've been dealing with electronic medical records my entire medical career. They do not save lives. It is bullshit. They have lied to the American public, They've used that as the reason to spend literally billions of dollars that could have gone to healthcare, providing medical care, to divert it off to these rich software companies and the investors, right? So Wall Street, and they're paying off the politicians. So it makes me absolutely sick to my stomach to even think about it. They're just lying to people about how beneficial EMRs are. They're not, okay? I don't care if you disagree with me. I know all about them. I have one, I'm forced to use one and they don't improve care, period. So, that said, I don't have a suggestion for you on which insurance to go to. I would suggest that you address your senators and congressmen about how they're not representing your best interests. That's what I would suggest. And that's it. All right, we're done with second surgery and off to the third shortly. Um, go take a potty break and get some soda and popcorn and we'll be back shortly with a, another patient who's got one herniated disc at C4-5, I think. I believe so, yeah. And we're just going to do a one level 
And then we got the last patient is a lower back lumbar, three levels lumbar deep laser disc repair. All right, it's been a pleasure as always. I enjoy the questions and keep the questions coming. Feel free to, if you know somebody with back or neck pain that wants to get fixed, submit your MRI at mri.dukespine.com. We'll type the address up. It's free. It may be um, slow to happen because of our staffing transitions, but we'll get to it and you'll get a free review. Um, for those trolls out there, <laughs> don't bother me because I have more important things than to, do, to do, like helping people that legitimately want to help. Don't troll me. Have a nice day.